Coming up next on Arizona Horizons Journalists Roundtable, we'll look at accusations that DES Director Tim Jeffries has an enemies list of public employees. And APS launches a $1 million campaign to elect GOP candidates to the Corporation Commission. Journalists Roundtable is next on Arizona Horizon. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Arizona PBS, members of your PBS station. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to Arizona Horizons Journalists Roundtable. I'm Ted Simons. Joining us tonight, Rachel Leingang of the Arizona Capital Times, Bob Christie of the Associated Press, and Mike Sonnix of the Phoenix Business Journal. DES Director Tim Jeffries faces accusations of creating a do not hire list of public employees that he had fired. What is going on? So over the course of the past a little bit more than a year and a half, he's fired almost 500 people. And he's been really blatant about it. He's talked to the media constantly saying he's trying to rid the agency of bullies and bad actors. Um, and now he's accused of creating this list that blacklists them from getting employment elsewhere. Um, which potentially illegal, I, I believe, uh, not, not a good idea at the very least to try to uh, make it impossible for others to get a job after they leave your employment. Came into the Department of Economic Security, kind of on the white horse, friend of uh, Governor Ducey's, kind of a, without management experience, was going to clean out. He called them bullies and other things. And th this st strikes a lot of people as bullying behavior. Yeah, it sure does. I mean, you know, the, the, at least the news reports that have been coming out from the Republic and the Cap Times and other sources look at this and say, well, you know, do these people, do, are these are, most of the people who were fired were older workers. They were longtime state employees. They had, the Republic did an analysis of their personnel files. They had an excellent, most, a lot of them had excellent above average employee reviews enough to where they could get bonuses. But this, of course, all dates back to a few years ago when the legislature at the request of Governor Brewer passed a law that offered a 5% pay raise for all state employees who gave up their civil service protection. And a lot, 90% of them have because it's 5, 10%. It's a lot of money for people who haven't got raises for years. Yeah, he's a private sector guy. He worked for a company in Colorado that owned Jane's Weapons uh, magazines. He was chief transformation officer there. He has, so he comes from the private sector. That's what the governor wants. That's what you see Republicans talk about is make government run more like a business. And one of those things is lack of job security. Um, Bob mentioned the, the legislation they passed. Um, he's an interesting uh, character. Uh, the story of the New Times about some of the videos that he sends out each morning for people to watch. I think he was a cheer leader at the University of uh, Santa Clara. Oh, yeah, that's yeah, true. Yeah, yes, the yes. mascot. And, and he, he's quite a character, and he's had some emails that he's sent out about religious things and politics. It's also got him in trouble. But, they, you know, they've taken away, the governor's obviously taken away his, his power to, to hire and fire. And, you know, I think we'll all be surprised if he's around for very much longer. I, I, I think was, maybe, maybe this might be one of those Christmas break type career changes. I was going to say, Rachel, I mean, uh, with everything going on here, um, so many folks being let go, and again, the Republic doing a great job here of showing how many of these folks were actually not only let go without cause, but these people were up for merit raises. It doesn't make any sense that all this is happening. Now, the governor has basically taken the, the whole responsibility of firing away from the guy. Right. I think you'll see some lawmakers uh, come session time make a little bit of hay about this, um, especially Democrats. They haven't been a fan of uh, the work he's done there. He's been pretty partisan. Like you mentioned, the religious emails, he had like an anti-Prop 205 email, anti-marijuana uh, legalization. So uh, he's been very controversial, to say the least. But is this a guy, Bob, who comes from the private sector? He has no government management experience whatsoever at all, period. Is he learning on the job? Well, you know, he better be. If he wants to keep his job, he's better be. So the governor, as was we just mentioned, stripped his ability to fire any more people. They put in someone from the Department of Administration in there to review any terminations. And then the governor's office today told the Republic that we're going to publicly say anybody who thinks they were wrongly fired, call the Department of Administration. We're going to review it. That's going to be a huge process. So, you know, here's a guy who's trying to transform a very big agency. It's the largest state agency, 7,500 employees. It, uh, of course, Department of Economic Security, that's unemployment insurance. It's welfare. It's child support. It used to be uh, Department of yes, uh, child. Ch child Safety yes. now, but that's gone. But, the, you know, it's the big social service agency. And there's a lot of folks who have worked for the government for decades who are very dedicated government workers, but maybe somebody does need to shake it up. It's hard to say. 
One thing I find interesting is the governor, when all this first started coming out, that he was firing a lot of people, that Jeffries was firing a lot of people, said, you know, if we could, we would clone him. They were really big fans of the things that he was doing, and it seems like maybe they've been pushed too far or potentially the public pressure has kind of led to this point where we're taking away some of his powers. Um, but certainly they've changed how they viewed him, yeah. uh, at least publicly, by taking away uh, his well, firing when ability. When you have people in their, who have spent their career working for the public, as a public servant, 25, 30, 35 years, they've got another year or two left before they can retire, and they're unceremoniously dumped for you know unknown reasons. You know, after a certain number of those, you start to wonder: Is that fair? Can, yeah, the, think, can the governor afford to keep him around? He, he can't even he can't even fire anyone. Well, you know, I think folks on on the right and folks in the in the private sector look at government agencies big government social welfare agencies and want them to be more efficient and too many people work there. They take kind of a different view of, of, of that. They think that they're not doing a good job, that they're just there to get a pension. Um, and, and so the backdrop of this being the former parent agency of CPS, which had so many problems, it's not a bad narrative for, for folks on the right and conservatives and business backgrounds to say, this guy should come in here and shake things up. We, we need government to act you, more like but that. But do you include in that narrative a list of people and, and uh, you know, asking the Department of Administration to pass these names around so that regardless of cause, we don't want them hired anywhere in state government. Yeah, that works against it. The, the, Bob mentioned the employee that was a couple days or months from, from retirement, had a health condition that got fired, and the, the blacklist. That works against that because that's easy for people, the average voter, the average person out there to see that and say that's wrong. If you're going out there and trying to make a big, big bureaucratic agency that's maybe inefficient, more efficient, that's fine. But some of these things where you're firing people right before retirement, you know, that relates to, people can relate to that. In Jeffrey's defense, he, he fully says, hey, listen, I'm doing the right thing. I, I think the people who have left the agency needed to leave the agency. And he's standing behind his actions, so kudos for that. All right, uh, we'll see where that leads. I have a feeling it's going to lead somewhere. We will, uh, that story's not over. Uh, speaking of stories that aren't over, parent company of APS has decided what the heck Let's throw in a million bucks to try to elect a Republican and the slate of Republican candidates to the Corporation Commission, which regulates APS. Right. So uh, the interesting thing about this one is if you, there have been allegations that they got involved in 2014 through some dark money groups. They came out and said, we've got money, we're going to spend it because we, we think that the Democrats here are too dangerous and that they wouldn't regulate us impartially. Um, and even though Bob Burns has been very critical of APS, he, they still think... Uh, he'd do better than the Democrats. So they, they put up almost $2 million now and could potentially put up more. Um, they haven't really put a cap on it, but they've been sort of doing ad blitz, uh, blitzes. You've seen a lot of TV ads um, touting Boyd Dunn and Andy Tobin and Bob Burns, the three re Republicans running. And again, uh, is Burns accepting this money, by the way? Well, it's not being spent on his campaign. It's the, this is an independent expenditure. So I can go, if you're running for office, I can go and take some film clips of you and put an ad together and go to the TV station and pay for it. And by law, I'm not even able to talk to you about it. It's an independent expenditure. So is Burns complaining <clears throat> about this? Thing. He's not complaining about it, but he also isn't, you know. I don't think any politician <laughs> would ever complain about somebody <laughs> running an ad. And, and the, the odd thing is Bob Burns is also the beneficiary of money that's being spent by Solar City. So Bob Burns is in the best possible worlds. He's got both sides saying elect bomb burns. So I suppose that might give him some... This, this, this kind of this, takes the wind out of the dark money story that's been going on forever with, with APS and put a real black eye on them. So finally they're, they're, they're poning up and they're being public about this just like Solar City, and they have the right to spend that. People can question that, how the, the, the commissioners act, but, but they have the right under Citizens United and the First Amendment to spend that money um, um, on whatever they want. Here, here's the troubling part about the whole thing, that a lot of critics of the way the system is set up now are, are saying is, listen, this is a regulatory agency that sets your electricity rates. Everybody, every Arizonan's electricity rates, unless you're an SRP customer, is set by the Corporation Commission. And the biggest electrical utility in the state wants to influence who their regulators are. I, I, again, right, so a regulated entity funding regulation candidates. Right. I mean, the interesting thing is the 2014 election totally you know, overshadowed anything else happening in this 2016 election. Um, but we've already surpassed the amount of outside spending. We're at like 4.7 million outside spending this year, um, which it was like 3.8 in 2014. And imagine, I mean, that, that smaller amount of money led to so much for the last two years. 
how how much further could this go on? That there's a lot of discussion of um, you know reg filings in, in rate cases saying this person can't sit in the rate case because they were the beneficiary of all this money. I, I think this just continues the the conversation. Compare the money that the Republican slate is getting with the money that the Democrats are getting from Solar City. So one of the Democrats hasn't gotten any really. Um, he got like two thousand dollars, and it was just in the form of an email from Solar City sent out to their customers saying vote for him. But otherwise. He hasn't gotten any. That, um, that, who is that? that? Tom Chapin. Tom Chapin, okay. And then Bill Mundell's had a lot spent on him. There's been TV ads and mailers and web ads. Um, I, I think it was approaching $2 million last I checked, but uh, that, uh, over one. That's the quandary here. With, with there, There's legitimate concerns for people that are worried about APS giving money to, to Republicans. But if, if you say APS, you can't do that, and Republicans, you can't, you can't accept that, or if they want to give direct contributions. Solar City is adverse to APS on things. They're a rival to them. So it, are they allowed to give? I mean, you know, are folks that don't, are, are voters that don't like what APS is doing, are they allowed to give, but then APS isn't? Um, so that's kind of the flip side of the, of the Well, yeah. and I think, again, before this, the argument was always Solar City is at least making it known. Yeah. You, you know that they are contributing. If you don't like the idea, the, the idea that they are contributing, go ahead and vote against who yeah. they're contributing to. I guess the same could be said now. If you don't like the idea that Pinnacle West APS is, is supporting these candidates, vote against the candidates they're supporting. Yeah, that's absolutely true. This is a fully transparent ad buy. It's an independent expenditure, but it's not a dark money group. Right. There's a definition there that, that we have to be dark money is you don't know who's paying for it. This, you, the APS fully disclosed. They sent out press releases. They made a round of calls to all of us who cover them and said, hey, this is coming today. You, may, you might care. And, and this may help Dunn. He's the one that, that people think, you know, it, it obviously Burns, everybody thinks going to get in there. And you think maybe the Democrats could get one of those seats. This kind of ad buy where he's lumped in with the other two, you know, might, might help him get over the top. You remember, yeah. a, APS is looking for a big increase in, in their rates that's in front of the commission now, and they're looking for a big change in the way solar companies, uh, people who have rooftop solar, get compensated. So there's a lot of money at stake here. I think the fact that everyone's spending so heavily shows that this race is pretty wide open. And polling has showed that uh, probably a third or more of voters haven't even decided yet, so there's still time to make an impression um, with people whose names you might not know. So that's why you're seeing a lot of money being spent now up, up until Election Day. I would imagine with all these five candidates, you would not be surprised if any combination of any three made it. I think it's wide open. I think the one that seems to be leading because of he's being supported by both sides is uh, Bob Burns, and he's had a lot of earned media to Right, his so if Bob Burns that. doesn't make it, that would surprise you. I'd be a little shocked by that. Okay, yeah. um, Sheriff Arpaio wants a judge removed. Mm -hmm. Mike, uh, this is not necessarily a blazing headline, uh, but it's <laughs> it still, happened before, right? it's happened before, yeah. it's happening again. Yeah. Talk to us about it. Yeah, uh, Murray Snow, the federal judge in the, in the civil contempt case and the racial profiling case, um, the one that kind of passed on the criminal contempt charges to the, to the Justice Department. Uh, uh, Joe and his lawyers want him off of there because of some, some I guess, alleged conversations he had with the, the overseer. Um, and, you know, they've, they've pulled this before. This is common in a lot of these types of cases. You know, does the judge have a bias? Does the, is the judge doing something that should disqualify him? The, uh, Mirega, the first judge in the profiling case, um, had to recuse herself because her sisters are the La, La Raza uh, leaders. So there's always these types of things. There's not good blood between the, between the two because Joe got uh, found in civil contempt because because he ignored that judge's orders, essentially. But yeah, but the idea is, uh, the, the crux here is that the judge was meeting with the court monitor in some way. Should, shouldn't, uh, the, he put the monitor in there in the first, shouldn't they be meeting? Yeah, no, they should be meeting. And actually what they're, they do meet. The judge hired the monitor, chose the monitor. The monitor's job is to go out and look at the Maricopa County Sheriff's Officer, and make sure that the orders the judge has, has issued are being complied with. And of course he has to meet with them regularly. What they're specifically looking at is one particular meeting where the sheriff's office called in and they had a discussion where the monitor and the sheriff, or monitor and the judge were in the same room and they're pulling out that. This is, this is a new law firm looking at the whole case and saying, Let's do some creative lawyering here and throw a Hail Mary. Well, well the crux of, which of a lot of legal officers I'm, think it is. It's a Hail Mary. I mean, the crux of Arpaio's defense and, and the political side of his defense is that the, the Justice Department is out to get him uh, because of his immigration enforcement. And he, there's allies uh, in, in the judicial system, including judges, that are also against his, his enforcement. And so and they, they try to just taint the messenger, is what they're trying to is do. Is that message getting across the vote? I mean, again, 
no, all publicity is supposed to be good publicity, but it just seems like for Arpaio, it's negative after negative after negative. What's this doing us to his campaign? Well, he has ads out now where he's just standing in front of the camera saying, you know, this is Obama's Justice Department coming after me. Um, he has a lot of money that he's campaigning on. Um, but there's just been so much going on with him that it leaves a real opening for a, a Democrat to win that seat, um, despite the money advantage, but because of all, um, you know, people are sick of paying for his legal fees that have, you know, gotten so out of hand. And, and they just, fiscally, they don't want to deal with it anymore. And then they, maybe they want a fresh start. Does it, does it help with the base to show that Arpaio's going after the judge and going after the... I mean, well, usually you don't want to file something like this right before the election. It's not necessarily flattering unless your base thinks they're, after, they're out to get well, him. Well, yeah. No, absolutely. That's, you know, his only hope at this point, after years of this, is to keep his base around him. So he's got it, you know, he... he He's got to get these people back to them and convince them that, you know, all this stuff you're hearing is BS, this garbage, he says in his ad. This is just the Obama Justice Department going after me. Forget about it. And the judicial part is, you know, is another, it's, it's, it's all legal. It's well, all when you look at the, the, the Arpaio base and the Trump base, uh, well, super, super parallels, and you hear Trump talk about the systems rigged, the media is against me, the establishment is against me, and, and Joe has the same type of supporters, the same type of, of argument. I, I just think it's interesting, if, if this case was going on 15 years ago, say it was when Symington or Meekum, how big of a story that would be that the, the sitting sheriff, the, the most well-known politician along with McCain in the state is, is facing criminal charges. It would be the big story each night on the local news and in the daily paper, and there'd be so much focus on this, and he would have a hard time. But the, the media environment, with social media and our phones and everything, we watch Fox News and CNN, it's not a, as big a story as, as it could have been if, if, if the local media and people were more focused on that. And that could be to Joe's advantage. Well, especially after he's just been charged. I mean, yeah. you know, it's, it's with, with, with criminal contempt. I mean, right. it, it's, it follows after follows after follows right. here. And, and he's due for trial in early December. Yes, we have a status conference, I think, on this particular case uh, next week. So Correct. we'll say, but again, again, before the election, once more, he'll make headlines for this. Hey, uh, County Attorney Bill Montgomery has filed a complaint with the county recorder's office regarding a dark money hit on him. Interesting. Interesting, sure. Well, you know, there's, in addition to Paul Penzone, who's running against Joe Pyle, George Soro, the billion, liberal billionaire, is pouring money into, the, into Penzone's race. Uh, as an independent expenditure, it's not a dark money group, he's disclosing it. He came in a couple weeks ago with the same thing against Bill Montgomery, a disclosed group where everybody knows who's spending it. But Bill Montgomery said, you didn't follow the law, even though you filed with the Secretary of State, you didn't send me a copy of the ad and you didn't tell me you were going to spend it. We get a lot of these this time of year where election lawyers, this is their bread and butter, they look at everything and if you haven't crossed an I or dotted, dotted an I or crossed a T, they're going to file a complaint against you. This could be a big deal if the secretary or if the attorney general actually determines that they violated the law, because they could order a full repayment of three all three times. Money. Three times. Yeah. yeah. So um, <clears throat> from the story I read, the Republic said that that group had showed that they had certified mail receipts that they did send him those yeah. uh, mailers ahead of time. But the mailers are just brutal. I mean, some, there was one that had like a bloody mattress on it, just really going after his record as um, a prosecutor. Um, it's got to be stinging, but I, I don't know how much it affects him, considering most people don't know the guy who's running against him. If, if anything, it's a vote against Montgomery, not a, a vote for uh, Diego Rodriguez. Yeah, it kind of shows that even, even super rich people don't know how to spend their money. If, if, nobody knows Diego Rodriguez. Nobody knows him at all. Um, everybody knows Paul Pinzone. Right? Pinzone's got a real chance of winning this. If, if you want to make an, an impact here, that's the race I, you, you would put money in. Um, I, I, and I know Soros is doing this in other, other jurisdictions. This just seems like uh, is, is bad, it, good money. Is it a bad. flexing of muscles just to, let's say, by the way, I'm out here? Well, you know, he's actually had, George Soros has had success in, in Florida knocking off a sitting DA. In other places, he's pouring money into sheriffs and DA's races because the down ballot races matter. In a Democratic uh, swing year like this where it's possible that we could have a a big change in 
nationally and possibly in Arizona between the Republicans and the Democrats, this could affect the down ballot races. As you know, if people are voting Dem, 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 and they come to an if, R, if we, they if, may if skip we that person. If we elect Diego Rodriguez County Attorney in Maricopa County, it is definitely a, a Dem year. That is a landslide yeah. year. Bill Montgomery is um, worried enough about it that he's calling press conferences I, and filing complaints and doing all the things he needs to do. I was going to say the fact that he's filing complaints shows that there's some concern there. Absolutely, and he's complaining about something that normally Republicans don't complain about. Like Republicans are normally okay with well, this isn't dark money, as we've said, but they haven't been, you know, mad about dark money. In fact, they tend to be very protective of it. So it's just sort of odd, you know, to have him call such a public meeting about that. All right. Speaking of public meetings, we had one uh, this week with uh, Donald Trump Jr. We are going to have a rally tomorrow with Donald Trump Sr. I believe Hillary Clinton set to hit town next Wednesday. Yep. Um, let's talk about the Trumps and the Trumps. So, what, what, uh, Definitely shows Arizona's in play. Yeah. I mean, the polls, all the polls out there have shown the race essentially tied. It's all within the margin of error. Trump's up one, Clinton's up one or a couple in another. Um, we, are, we are one of the, uh, the battleground states, which is obviously not the norm, considering how many times we've gone Republican in the, in the 20th century, 21st century. Um, so they're both coming here, and it's, it's a home stretch. And it shows something uh, that the Democrats do have some confidence here, that they're sending Hillary Clinton here uh, next week. The, week before the election. Uh, so, I, and the Trump's showing up here too. Um, so there, I think you're going to see some ad buys probably on the Democratic side. They've been, they've been putting money here and resources here. And I think you're seeing Trump um, act accordingly. This race is all over the place. I mean, the polls are up and down. This FBI thing with uh, Anthony Weiner stuff now um, is, is changing the race again. Um, so I don't think a lot of us know what's going to happen. And, and Bob's right. We could have a big Democratic year here. Well, or, 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 what, or all these Trump folks could turn out and carry Trump and maybe carry or pile, um, you know, to, to, a, to a close victory, well, maybe he wouldn't get it. Hillary Clinton's trying to expand the electoral map. She's, she's coming to Arizona to a state that hasn't gone Republican, or that hasn't gone Democrats since, since her husband was president. Yep. She's going, he's going to Colorado, which should be easy for him. He's coming to Arizona, which he shouldn't have to think about. He should be in Florida, you know, trying to win Florida. Or in Ohio, making sure he's going to win Ohio, instead of going to a state that should be in his back pocket. That's that's telling. It's very indicative. I mean, if he loses Arizona, it's it's an indictment of Trumpism, basically. If we're a state that normally would go red, we we would go blue for someone like Hillary Clinton that has a lot of baggage. That that would be a huge blow to the Trump campaign. A, a seventh visit. This will be the seventh visit for for Donald Trump mm -hmm. to Arizona. Uh, work with me here. Does it help to have Donald Trump? Here? Does it help for people to hear him and see him? I, I wonder some, the negatives are so strong on both of these candidates. I wonder sometimes if the best campaign move for both of them is to go find a closet and get inside. I think Trump maybe should stay stay inside during this 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 latest email thing. Let 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 that suck up all the oxygen. He's had a hard time doing that. Um, I, I think their path to victory, which a lot of people don't think there is one, is to turn out so many people that that don't usually vote. So many working class whites, older whites that are so fed up with the establishment, with us in the media, with trade policies, with the job market, that they're going to change the landscape of things. But, but is that they're the, going to change the landscape of things. And so and so he's he's going around and he's making a lot. More more uh, campaign stops than she is. She'll make three stops in Ohio and Florida. He's going to be in Colorado before that. His path to victory is to kind of not change the map, but change the voter turnout. The but voter if, turnout that's, thing. if that's the right uh, message, is he the right messenger? Well, I, you, we'll find out in <laughs> 10 days. <laughs> Clinton tried the stay in the closet thing after the convention. She was up by eight, ten That's where her points. Email servers are after, too, I believe. <laughs> <laughs> after the convention, she was up by eight or ten points. I mean, and she just said, "Okay, we're just going to coast it out and let Donald Trump do his thing." And over the next several weeks, her lead went down to where they were tied nationally. You can't do that if you're running yeah. a campaign. No matter how okay. the negatives are, you've got to be on the campaign trail every day, making news, good news, impressing voters going to the states you need to, and both of them are going to be moving every single day until November 8th. And he's getting big, I mean, he gets big crowds, and that's certainly no indication that he's going to win, right? We, we've seen this before. Mitt Romney had big crowds in Pennsylvania, in Philadelphia. They didn't win. Yeah. Well, so, so, the but, big but, crowd theory seems but, to have but fallen. But their right? hope is that they're going to energize new voters, people that don't vote so much, that they can change the dynamic. The, 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 poll, the, the polling doesn't show those voters. We'll see. Well, 
that argument has been tried and it failed with Mitt Romney and there's nothing to, sh to there's no evidence that it won't fail this time. And again, as, we, as I asked you with the Corporation Commission, would you be surprised at all if either one of them won this race? No, I mean, 10 days left to just think everybody's ready for it to be over. <laughs> so so uh, no matter what happens, I, I don't think it'll be surprising because what could be more surprising than yeah. how 2016 has gone so far? We had the October surprise today from the FBI. That's going to hurt Hillary Clinton. Um, if Donald Trump can, can capitalize on that, you know, we'll see. All right. We will indeed see. Thank you all for joining us. We certainly do appreciate it. That is it for now. I'm Ted Simons. Thank you so much for joining us. You have a great weekend. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Arizona PBS, members of your PBS station. Thank you.